And moving on to chapter 16, and remember we are combining chapters 14 and 16, but two total sets of notes, and I'll make one test out of that. So I took the highlights out of 16, put together to talk about properties of fluids, the gas laws, and fluid mechanics, and we're ready to begin. There is a little more math in this section. So here we go. Pressure. Now, pressure in normal everyday conversation has a whole lot of meanings. Like we may feel pressured to do something or big game and bases loaded, two outs, down by one, and you got the tying run at third, the go-ahead run at second, and an insurance run on first, and you may feel a lot of pressure because you're facing a good pitcher. Pressure to pass the test because it's the end of the quarter, you need to do well on this test. But in science, pressure is the amount of force applied to a given area. Now, I capitalize the words force and area for a reason because in the equation, all three letters for pressure, force, and area will be capitalized. Here's your formula. Pressure equals force divided by area. And the unit in the metric system is called the Pascal. In the English system, it might be something like pounds per square inch. So I had pounds, force, divided by square inch, a small area, and that's exactly what pressure is, a force divided by the area on which the force is applied. So here's your equation form, P equals F divided by A. Pressure equals force divided by area, and just like with all the other equations, if I know any two of those numbers, I can very easily figure out the third. If I know force and area, I will divide to get pressure. If I know pressure and area, I will multiply to get force. If I know pressure and force, I'll do a switch and a division to get the pressure. For example, 5,000 newtons. Let's say a big sign falls onto the ground. The sign weighs 5,000 newtons and has an area of 20 square meters, maybe four meters by five meters. Four times five is 20. And that sign hits the ground. Well, 5,000 newtons of force is going to hit 20 square meters of area on the ground. How much pressure got applied? I simply divide. 5,000 divided by 20 is 250 newtons per square meter, which is similar to pounds per square inch in the English system, although square meter is much larger. And I call that a Pascal, named after the scientist who studied pressure and forces an area. So we call it 250 pascals. So it's just a simple division. Now common sense will tell us something. If we increase the force, let's say the sign weighed more, would we get more or less pressure? Duh, we'd get more pressure. The same weight, 5,000 newtons, if that had a larger area, well, we're taking the same force, again, think common sense, and spreading the area out over a larger area, that's gonna be less pressure on each point of contact, as you'll see on the next page mathematically. So remember the two numbers, 5,000 newtons and 20 square meters, and then the answer, 250 pascals. Ready? Again, common sense with the math verifying common sense. If we increase force, we're going to increase the pressure. Now, anytime, again, this is mathematical, but also common sense. We have pressure equals force divided by area. Anytime we increase the top of a fraction, we increase the answer. And anytime we increase, make that easier to see, the bottom of a fraction, we're going to decrease the answer. And if we were to decrease the area, we will increase the answer. And if we were to decrease the force, we would decrease the answer. Again, common sense, but the math verifies. Now remember, in the original example, we had 5,000 newtons. Let's double that to make the sign way more. 10,000 newtons, more material, but still four by five, so 20 square meters. When that sign hits the ground, remember originally we had 250 pascals, but we've doubled the force, therefore we're going to double the pressure from 250 to 500. And it's going to happen in the same ratio. Since we increased the force, kept the area the same, we increased the pressure. 
Now, if we increase the area, go back to the 5,000 newtons we started with, but let's make the area larger. Now, instead of four by five, maybe this sign was five meters by 10 meters. So 50 square meters, we have the same amount of force, but spread out over a larger area. So there's less pressure on each point of contact, 100 pascals as opposed to 500. Okay, so 5,000 divided by 50 is 100 pascals. You notice there, increase the force up top, we got a higher pressure, increase the area, we got a lower pressure. And again, if we were to decrease the top and decrease the bottom, well, the opposites would happen to the pressure than what you see up here. Okay. Mathematics, but common sense verifies by the mathematics. Ready? Okay, now, just look at this sign here. You look at the truck, you have a two lane road, maybe going in behind the shopping center. There's a two lane road, and there you see that the weights of the trucks can vary and the road will support more weight if the trucks are spread out longer. So you look here at the 41 ton truck, there are three wheels and three on the other side, so six points of contact in a smaller area. A larger truck the road can support more weight because now in this case there are four and four on the other side there are eight points of contact and a larger area. Now look what happens when we use the largest truck. Now the road can support the truck weighing 60 tons because that higher weight is spread out over a larger area and there are more points of contact. In this case, five and five on the other side, 10 points of contact. So each point of contact is actually exerting less pressure on the road. Now there will be a point where the road's not going to support, maybe not an 18 wheeler, it must be a very strong road. But you see right here that if the truck is larger, the truck can hold more weight as long as that weight is spread out over a larger area so the road can support not necessarily the weight, but the pressure being applied to the road at each point of contract, contact. So that makes sense. Ready? Now, buoyancy is a force in a fluid that pushes things up. Remember, gases and liquids are fluids. Look at the picture to the right. And you see that the cork, the first picture on the left, the gravity is pulling down, the buoyancy is pushing up. Because if you can see the little holes there, this is a cork, very lightweight. So the buoyancy is able to push up pretty easily. We have this just a little bit underneath the surface of the liquid. And most of it is floating. Now wood, in the middle picture there, Wood will absorb some of the water. Look carefully, you'll see that there's more of the wood block, the same volume, underneath the surface, but the wood's still kind of floating above, but more than half of that block of wood is inside the fluid. Now this may be a piece of steel, same volume, but steel is much denser. Wood is denser than cork. Cork is a less dense, medium density of these three, and the densest of all, density will cause that steel block to sink all the way to the bottom. So density and buoyancy will help determine if an object sinks or floats or goes somewhere in between. Someone named Archimedes discovered that there's a fluid that has a force pushing objects up and every fluid pushes up on an object. We drop things into the water like a swimming pool. Unless the object is too dense, the water will push the object back to the surface because of the force of buoyancy. Even air, remember gases are also fluids, but gases are so thinned out that there's a very small buoyant force. And as we get higher up into the atmosphere, the gases thin out even more, so that buoyancy is less and less and less. For an object to float, the buoyant force pushing up, look at the cork, the first picture, is greater than the weight of the object gravity pulling down. So this buoyant force is actually stronger than the gravitational pull. That's why the cork is going to float. And because the cork is less dense, that cork isn't going to fight through the buoyancy as easily as in the steel or even the block of wood will. For the object to sink, look at the steel on the right side. 
that weight of the object is stronger than the buoyant force and the density also. So the force is still pushing up, but then the density of the object and the weight of the object is forcing through that fluid, therefore that object is going to sink. Now the block isn't completely underneath, could be, but immersed means somewhere in between. It's possible that that block of wood could be somewhere in between. I don't want it all the way to the bottom. Maybe not halfway, but somewhere in between. That's when the forces are more equal. The buoyancy going up is more equal to the gravity coming down. We may get the object to rest somewhere inside the fluid, not necessarily halfway. But that wood block at least has more than half of the wood under the surface of the water, so that's considered immersed. Ready? Look at the pictures here. When we talk about the gas laws, you see a calculator right there. Now again, common sense and the math will verify. There are 13 molecules showing in each container here, but remember, gases will fill up the container. If the lid is higher up, well then these molecules have room to spread out. And if I raise the lid even more to maybe up here, these molecules would spread out even more. Of course, there are 13 showing. There may be millions and millions and millions actually in the container. But look what happens if we push down on the lid, the molecules get closer together. The volume shrinks as we increase the pressure. And as we lift up the lid, then the volume increases. So if we decrease the pressure, we will increase the volume. This is Boyle's Law. A scientist named Boyle came up with it. If we increase pressure, we will decrease volume. And that is what the top picture shows. If we decrease pressure, we will increase volume. And mathematically, the two sides, the products, will be equal to each other. If we multiply the pressure times the volume of the first container, we're going to get the same answer as if we multiply the pressure and the volume of the second answer. I'm going to save the examples for the assignments this time, however. Now, look at the bottom picture. You see the flames. Now, think way back to the beginning of the year when we talked about phases of matter. As gases gain more energy, their particles spread out more and more. Well, look at the flames. On the left, temperature 1 is smaller than temperature 2. Uh, let's count the molecules. I count 12 in each container here. But as we increase the temperature, look what happens to those gas particles. Those particles will spread out. So as we increase the temperature of the gas, the particles gain more energy, and then the particles will spread out. So in Charles's law, if we increase temperature, we increase volume. In Charles's law, both do the same. Let's put that formula up here. In Boyle's law, if we increase the pressure, we will decrease the volume. And mathematically, that's going to work. And again, I'll save the examples for when we do the assignments. But in Charles's law, this is actually more like a fraction. So let's write it a little more like you're familiar with. If I increase the volume, I'm going to increase the temperature, which this shows. And if I decrease the volume, I'm going to decrease the temperature. And in Boyle's Law, if I decrease the pressure, I'm going to increase the volume. So when we read the word problems, read carefully. What are we talking about? If we're talking about pressure, we're going to use Boyle's Law. If we're talking about temperature, we will use Charles's Law. Both of them will use volume. Okay, let's take that off. Now, Charles's law, though, uses the Kelvin scale, not the Fahrenheit and not the Celsius. And Kelvins, those numbers make things seem hotter than they really are. 300 Kelvins sounds like that might be a really hot temperature. It's actually quite cool. That's pretty close to room temperature, actually. Then you get into higher and higher numbers. Then, eventually, those Kelvins do get very hot. But low numbers of Kelvins are very, very cold. Okay, so Kelvins, that's the one we're less familiar with, but these two gas laws right here both use, or the Charles's law of temperature uses the Kelvin scale. Ready? Okay, now let's look at hydraulics. We need to get the car work done. There aren't many people who can lift a car by themselves. So the mechanics, 
Some of them, they'll have a pit under the ground. They can go down there and work on the car. And others will use a hydraulic lift or a hydraulic press to raise the car up. Well, what's happening here is there's a fluid inside the machinery that we don't really see. And it's most likely not water, but a much thicker fluid. Okay, let's see what's going on here. Remember, pressure equals force divided by area. Now, I'll tell you about this in a moment that says F equals PA. If we apply the pressure here, well, that pressure is going to come across here and go up. Now, actually, a lot more than just the lines I'm drawing. And then up over here, and then up over here, and then up over here, and then up over here. We're going to use the same force. Remember when we talked about pulleys, we apply the effort force and each segment of rope has that same effort force. Well, each spot in the fluid has that same force that's applied right here. What we did in the case that I drew, now there are actually more than five points, but we multiplied that force by five. Really, there are many more than five arrows that we could have drawn in there. So that would increase the force even more. Now, the picture doesn't look like it because remember, these are circles. Okay, this says area two is 10 times as much as area one. So what that did, instead of five, it'd be six, seven, eight, nine, 10 arrows. Well, we would have multiplied the force being put in by 10. Okay, now, since pressure equals force divided by area and we're working on the force, all I do is multiply by area, bam, and I get A times P equals F, or F equals P times A, which you'll see on the screen. The car brakes and the automobile lifts, these use hydraulics. The car brakes, when we apply the brake pedal, the fluid will take the little bit that we put in and use the fluid to increase the force to bring the car more safely to a stop. The automobile lift, as you see there, take that original force, spread that out over a larger area, and increase the force. So what happens here is we apply pressure to the brakes or the hydraulic lift. See that plunger on the left being pushed down, and the fluid is going to spread that pressure evenly throughout the fluid. And when we do the math, since we are increasing the total amount of pressure over a larger area, we are increasing the amount of force. So this will be able to raise that car a lot more easily. And this says A1 is 10 times stronger, A2 is 10 times stronger than A1. Well, if I multiply this by 10, then I'm gonna multiply the force by 10. In that example, the force put in got multiplied by 10. That means the car could weigh as much as 10 times the amount of force and pressure put in. Ready? Okay, Bernoulli's principle. Some of you are baseball players. You might use Bernoulli's principle without realizing that you're doing so. Hey, look at the wing on the airplane. Okay, let's come over here. Okay. All right, we have a race. Okay, we got a race here. We got Tommy and Johnny about to race. But instead of trying to win, what they're gonna do is take two different paths and they're gonna try to reach the finish line at the same time. Now, Johnny has much of a straighter path and Tommy has to go a curve. Now again, they wanna see if they can get here at the same time. Now, since the curve path is a little longer, here again, common sense tells us that Tommy's gonna have to run a little bit faster than Johnny, who has a much straighter path for them to end up here at the same time. Well, that's what's happening with the air. Okay, take this off and you look here, pressure exerted by faster moving air over the top, slower moving air here. Now, think about Bernoulli's principle. The faster moving air is not touching the wing as long in time as a slower moving air is in one spot. Therefore, we have a larger pressure pushing up on the wing and a smaller pressure pushing down. Since there's more pressure going up than down, 
then we get our lift. That wing or that aircraft is going to rise up off the ground. Okay. As fluid pressure decreases, the speed will increase, or fluid pressure decreases as the speed increases. With that fluid, that air, moving faster past the top of the wing, that air is pushing less on the wing, going straight down because it's moving straight across. So there's more pressure going to lift that. Think of a hose, which you're gonna actually see on the next page here. Now, I mentioned you athletes might use Bernoulli's principle quite a bit, especially pitchers. You wanna throw a curveball. How do you use Bernoulli's principle to throw a curveball? Okay, the airplane is shaped like a bird's wing. Here again is where humans invented something and took credit for something that God had already created. But in a curveball, notice this says higher air pressure, lower air pressure. Since the pressures are different, the air here and the air here are going to push on the ball differently and cause one part of that ball to rotate faster than the other part. So when we throw a curve ball, we take one finger, usually the middle finger, and we push harder on the ball, and then we snap our wrists. By pushing harder on one point of that ball, that part of the ball is moving faster than the rest of the ball. Scientifically, yeah, that's the case, even though it may not seem like it makes sense to us. And because one part of the ball is moving a little faster, the pressure against that part of the ball is smaller, that wind is gonna push the ball in a different direction. So curveballs use Bernoulli's principle by applying more pressure to one part of the ball. Ready? Now look at the hose. You don't have to copy anything here. Just look and, and listen. Look at the picture on the left side here. The words may be hard to see inside the green box. The left arrow says the fluid moves faster here and has less pressure. And the right side says the fluid moves slower here and has more pressure. Okay, we have a wider hose or pipe, and you know, it's like the hallways. When the hallways are wide and less crowded, it's a lot easier to move through those hallways. But then you get to where the hallway narrows and more people are joined together in one area, then it's a little harder to get through but the pressure is going to force that fluid through and the increased pressure is going to shoot that water out the other side. That water will come out moving faster and travel further. Okay, look here. You have the hose just open-ended and see how the water just kind of comes out on a stream being pulled down by gravity. But by putting our thumb here at the end and leaving a smaller opening, we didn't do anything else to the hose. What we have here is that water being shot out because of the pressure change, and that water is going to go faster and further out, so we would get a longer reach. Maybe we're trying to water the flowers and the hose can't quite reach that, but by putting a thumb here or a nozzle at the end, squeeze the trigger, there's a much smaller opening at the end of the nozzle than at the end of the hose itself. So the principle is going to speed up that fluid because of the pressure. And there you go, Bernoulli's principle. The end, hopefully you don't feel too much pressure to pass the test. Ha, 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 ha. Thanks again.